with you what will hopefully be a lot of useful, practical, uh, you know, actionable um, information, as well as hopefully answer some questions, bust some myths. As uh, speaking of questions, if you have those as we go along, feel free to type them into the chat area, and then I will get to them at the end of the presentation. Of course, normally when we can meet face to face, like in the old days, uh, I'd take questions as we go along, and that's challenging to do in a webinar. Uh, but do you know? Feel free to type those in, and we'll get to those at the end. I've got about. 45 to 50 minutes worth of information to share with you and that leaves us 10 to 15 minutes worth of questions or we can go a little bit longer if, if we have time. I know this is a big topic with lots of information and there's usually lots of questions uh, around that so uh, don't hesitate on that. So what is the topic we're talking about tonight? Well it is cardiovascular health, heart health, uh, specifically heart health from the inside out, uh, a topic that's also sometimes called, how's your endothelium today? What the heck is that and why does it matter? We're gonna get to all of that and hopefully provide you with a functional approach to cardiovascular health. This is a really important topic because heart attacks and strokes are the leading killer of men and women in North America. And so this is very serious. It's a, it's a matter of life or death. And it's something about which we can, uh, you know, be proactive and, and truly make a difference if we know what to do and if we're not being led astray by things that I'll, you know, touch on tonight. So I, uh, Melissa did a great job of introducing me so I can skip over this part and move right into a little bit of a background definition just so we're all on the same page to know what we're really focusing in on tonight when I say heart health. The term uh, heart health is quite a general or vague uh, and certainly has more to do than just with the heart itself. We're talking about cardiovascular disease, cardio referring to the heart, vascular, the blood vessels. That is a very broad term that can refer to any disease that affects either the heart and or blood vessels, which includes, of course, things like per, uh, peripheral artery disease, varicose veins, uh, failure of the heart muscle itself. So uh, congestive heart failure, which is, can be a slow progressive condition. We're not talking about everything because we don't have time. We're going to focus in on what's called coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. And this is um, a hardening or blockage potentially of the arteries that feed the heart, the three major arteries that feed the heart, because when things go wrong there, that's what causes heart attacks. And so we're gonna focus in on this, but that can manifest elsewhere in the body. It can manifest similar process in the brain leading to strokes. And everything I talk about tonight is helpful for the health of the whole cardiovascular system. And we're gonna zoom in on, on some aspects of it here or there, but that's the major one we're focusing on because that's the big killer. Okay, so before I move forward, we're going to do a little poll because I want to try to make this interactive and and, uh, and get your feedback. And the first poll is going to be a simple true or false. So you can weigh in when you see the poll coming up, hit your true or false button. And the true or false question is cholesterol causes heart attacks, true or false, high cholesterol or cholesterol causes heart attacks. And this is, uh, oh, I didn't hit the publish button. Excuse me, there we go. That's just hitting start doesn't make the poll start. You have to hit publish. Okay, so you should be seeing the poll here now and I'll let everyone weigh in. There's quite a few people, so it may take a couple of minutes. And, um, you know, for a long time, the focus of heart health has been almost exclusively around cholesterol, right? Uh, get your cholesterol measured. If it's high, take a medicine to lower cholesterol. Uh, for a while, we would speak about, for example, eating a low cholesterol diet. We, we don't talk about that anymore because we know that if you try to cut cholesterol out of your diet, um, your body will simply make more to compensate. So we don't t talk about that, but we still talk about low fat diets and we can, we can um, discuss that. Okay, I think looks like most people have weighed in and we're almost 50-50, almost neck and neck here uh, with false leading just a little bit. And, and maybe the 
uh, title of my talk, which is Move Over Cholesterol, was a bit of a hint. But in fact, even though there has been so much emphasis on uh, cholesterol in terms of causing heart attacks, 50% of people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol levels at the time of their heart attack and no history of ever having had high cholesterol. So that means that you can go to your doctor, have your cholesterol checked, see that it is normal, and think that maybe you're out of the woods, you have no risk for having a heart attack, but half of the people who have heart attacks have not had high cholesterol. So we know that it is possible, absolutely, and not uncommon to have a heart attack even if you don't have high cholesterol. But what about the flip side? What if you do have high cholesterol? Does that mean you're going to have a heart attack? How good a predictor is cholesterol of your risk of having heart attack? In other words, if your cholesterol is high, how concerned should you be? So are cholesterol levels a good predictor of having a heart attack? Well, certainly for people age 60 and over, they aren't at all. Um, here is one study. I know there's a, there's a lot of information here. I don't necessarily uh, intend for you to read it all, but I just wanted you to see that this is pulled right from the British Medical Journal, quite a prestigious journal. And this is a, um, a published study that echoes many other um, studies that have been done, in fact, in recent years to show that high cholesterol levels are not a great predictor of whether or not you will have a heart attack. Specifically, this study done on people 60 years and older shows in fact no association between your cholesterol levels and your risk of having a heart attack. And in fact, there may be what is called here a slight inverse association, which means they've shown that slightly elevated cholesterol seems to be associated with a somewhat lower risk of having a heart attack in people 60 years and older. Um, also associated with a lower risk, by the way, of dementia. So just because you have high cholesterol doesn't mean you're gonna have a heart attack. And by the way, this is based on LDL cholesterol, not total cholesterol. We're not taking into account the good cholesterol here, but simply the so-called bad cholesterol. It's not a great predictor. And just because your LDL cholesterol is elevated a little bit, um, doesn't necessarily mean you have to take a medicine to lower it. So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, shortly. But just so you know, um, cholesterol is not necessarily a villain when it comes to heart disease. Um, cholesterol, blaming cholesterol for heart attacks and strokes in many cases is like blaming firemen for the fire. Just because we see firemen usually where there's a fire doesn't mean they caused it. Um, they're often there trying to help the problem. Similarly, when there's inflammation in the body, that can cause cholesterol to rise. Ultimately, if the body can't help and heal that inflammation, things can progress and a heart attack may happen. But that doesn't mean that cholesterol caused it. So if cholesterol, and we're going to go back to, by the way, statin medications in a little bit and, and you know, their usefulness, uh, etc. But if cholesterol is not causing heart attacks, then what is? Or if cholesterol is not a good predictor of whether you're going to have a heart attack or stroke, what is? Well, it turns out the amount of calcium you have in those three major arteries that feed the heart, the coronary arteries, is an excellent predictor of whether or not you will have a heart attack. So there's a, a test you can get, a scan, a type of super fast CT scan, not commonly available in Canada, unfortunately. Quite commonly available in the US and back when we could cross the border, and we will one day eventually be able to do that again, I'm sure. You could go down to the States and get one of these scans, usually for a few hundred dollars. And when people email me and say, oh, my CAC score, which is my coronary artery calcium scan score is, then I know they're American, uh, usually, um, because uh, the Americans get this test. And so this will tell you how much calcium is in your arteries. And that correlates very well. It's a very good predictor of risk of having a heart attack. And so uh, knowing this, knowing that cholesterol isn't a great predictor, calcium is a good predictor, we can start to shift our focus in terms of being proactive. So whether or not you have high cholesterol, you don't necessarily know whether you have calcium in your arteries. We can talk about that, especially if you're Canadian, you can't get this test right now. 
Um, so this helps us, though, shift our approach to being proactive about heart health in ways that are much more functional, much more addressing the causes of heart attacks and strokes um, than our current situation or what we have been doing up until now. So by the way, what are risk factors around heart disease? Um, if high cholesterol is not a, a great predictor, you know, what kinds of things do predispose us to developing heart disease and or eventually a heart attack? Being overweight or obese, having high inflammation in the body, uh, smoking, of course, a sedentary lifestyle, so never exercising, diabetes or even having high blood sugar, even if you're not diabetic, so diabetes or prediabetes, and or an extensive family history on top, by the way, of all those things. You can have a family history, but still, um, you know, get around that by you know, not smoking, being physically active, keeping your blood sugar normal, for example. So these are some of the heart disease risk factors beyond cholesterol that are, you know, largely within our control, except for the family history, of course. So let me say something about, um, so just to, to conclude, just so everyone's clear, cholesterol can be a factor in heart disease. And it's, by the way, a, a more serious concern if cholesterol levels are high in young people, especially young men. So if you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, and you have high cholesterol, that can be associated with a higher risk of a heart attack. But, you know, after even as early as 50, that association really decreases. Um, cholesterol really only becomes harmful. We talk about good and bad cholesterol, but even the so-called bad cholesterol is really only bad when it becomes oxidized. And I'll talk about how to prevent that uh, because if you're, even if you have lots of LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, if it's not oxidized, it's not really bad because it, it can't be harmful. Okay, so we're talking a lot about cholesterol. I know a lot of people are taking cholesterol-lowering medications. Actually, let's do a poll on that. Um, reset my poll. Okay, here is a new poll. I'm putting out a new poll to, to find out whether you are taking a statin medication, that's cholesterol-lowering statin medication, whether you are not taking a statin medication, or whether your doctor has mentioned the possibility of maybe taking a statin and you're sort of not sure researching it, maybe that's what drew you out tonight. I mentioned that specifically because there's always people in the audience who have been told they should take a statin or maybe down the road they should take a statin. This is also coming up because even though your cholesterol levels may not have changed over the years, the guidelines for when statins are recommended keep changing and they keep going down. So more people are being recommended to take them. Um, so let's see here where it looks like the, the numbers are still coming in, but looks like we're coming up with about 50%, a little bit more than 50% of people not taking a statin, about a third of people uh, taking a statin and a little bit less than 20% of people who their doctor has mentioned possibly to that that might be down the future or down the road and are wondering about it. So hopefully this will provide you with some useful information tonight. Okay, so let's talk about then uh, statin medications briefly. So statin medications absolutely will lower your cholesterol levels, but studies have shown, and this is something called the NNT. You can check this out online. It's a website called the NNT.com. NNT means numbers needed to treat. And this is a way to a scientific way to assess the effectiveness, relative effectiveness, as well as relative benefit and harm risk uh, um, ratio for any treatment, uh, whether it's a medication or any other kind of treatment or intervention. And specifically with regards to statin cholesterol lowering medications and what's called primary prevention, in other words, preventing a heart attack in people who have never had a heart attack, so preventing a first heart attack, statins aren't that great. It turns out that statins have no statistically significant mortality benefit. In other words, they don't save lives. They don't, in people who have not ever had a heart attack, they don't seem to prevent you from having a first heart attack or, or very, very small, one in 217, um, one in 313 avoiding, um, a, again, a non-fatal stroke. Uh, but on the flip side, one in 21 people taking them will experience 
uh, pain from muscle damage. And by the way, if you are taking a statin medication and experiencing muscle pain, especially leg cramps or pain, back pain even, uh, do see your doctor because that um, can mean a side effect from the medication. So I'm not recommending everybody, anybody stop their medication if they have been prescribed one. Um, but if you're considering it and you're not sure, basically, if you've never had a heart attack before, statins don't seem to be great at preventing them. Now, if you have already had a heart attack, then that the, you know, the equation changes. Statins seem to be decent at reducing your risk of having a second heart attack. So this is just something to keep in mind. And um, certainly, as we said, there's not a great association for people over the age of 60. So if all you have is some high cholesterol, but otherwise, um, you know, you're not diabetic and you're not smoking and you, you know, live a normal um, a or moderately active lifestyle, I wouldn't be so concerned um, about lowering your cholesterol. Okay, so that is... Statins. Now, if you are taking statins, by the way, uh, it's good to know that and be aware that statins in, in the, the mechanism by which they work in the body to block cholesterol production will also block the production of something called coenzyme Q10. CoQ10 is a very important antioxidant in the body. Antioxidants fight free radicals and they prevent oxidization of your cholesterol. So really important nutrients and, and um, they have an important role to play in the body. So uh, absolutely, if you're taking a statin medication, you should be taking a CoQ10 supplement to make sure you don't become deficient. Um, CoQ10 is also really important for energy production. It's called the cellular spark plug. It works in the mitochondria, which are sort of like the batteries or energy producing centers of our cells. And uh, we need that, of course, throughout the body everywhere, but especially the heart muscle, always beating, needs a ton of energy. And so low CoQ10 levels can affect heart muscle function, energy levels in the body, brain function, really important. Uh, coenzyme Q10 is an important nutrient for everyone, and it will work as an antioxidant and helps with energy production for everyone. And it is an, it is an important nutrient for all around heart health, absolutely. Uh, but specifically, if you're on a statin medication, it's an important one to be aware of and to be supplementing with. Uh, the one I'm showing here is called ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is a form of CoQ10 that we find in the body. It's normally in this form. And in this form, it is highly bioavailable and absorbable. And typically 100 milligrams would be a, a typical dose, especially for somebody, again, taking a statin medication or if you're generally concerned about energy production or um, heart muscle function uh, or just heart health in general. Okay, so I wanna talk about why blood vessels are not just clogged pipes. <laughs> when uh, we talk about you know blockages of blood vessels, uh, we sometimes think of, or for a long time I've thought about the, sort of the clogged pipes theory. Our blood vessels are like um, pipes and they become clogged with fat and then that causes a heart attack. But in fact, blood vessels are quite different from that because they contain a very dynamic lining called the endothelium. The lining of our blood vessels is just one cell layer thick, but this one cell layer is remarkable and it actually controls the environment in and around its area in the blood vessels. And so um, under the right circumstances and with the right support, for example, if there's damage in that area, the endothelium can help heal it. It can control the tension so it can dilate or constrict blood vessels in specific areas. And ultimately, if there is inflammation in the body, that can affect the endothelium. And there's a number of other things that can affect the endothelium or prevent it from doing its job properly. And I'll explain what a lot of those are. Um, and then the endothelium can't do its job properly. And so this is where you can get clots or clogs or plaques as we call them or even hardening of the arteries which I'll talk about and so really looking at and understanding the endothelium and how it works and what we can do to support it is what helps to keep our blood vessels healthy whether cholesterol is high or low um, then supporting the endothelium is really important for overall heart health 
uh, brain health. Um, this is, I just thought this was kind of a funny snapshot, again, a text heavy, but it's a, it's a snapshot from a journal of the International, uh, International Journal of Biological Sciences, where I found that the study authors talking about like an overview of the endothelium really weren't mincing words when they said that alterations in endothelial cells, problems with the endothelium, um, plays a role in a broad spectrum of the most dreadful of human diseases, including a vascular disease, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, insulin resistance, um, and severe viral infections. And so I just think that is bang on. And if we know how to understand and take care of our endothelium, it can help with our heart health and so much more. So you know, uh, problems with the endothelium go above and beyond just heart attacks and strokes. Um, you know, dementia, memory loss, vision loss, sleep apnea, hypertension, uh, lots of other aspects of our vascular health. So we have to start thinking about our endothelium as an organ that we can um, support just like any other organ. We know a lot about um, other aspects of, of organ health and, and this is one of them to be aware of. Okay, so... So knowing this, knowing that cholesterol maybe has led us astray to a certain extent in the fight against heart disease, knowing that you can have a heart attack even if your cholesterol levels are normal, and just because your cholesterol levels are high doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack, we can sort of shift gears and shift our perspective and, and understand new functional approaches, functional goals to be proactive about our heart health. And these include lowering inflammation, because ultimately inflammation is what sets off the uh, chain of events that can lead to plaque deposition and, and clots and uh, heart attacks and strokes. If there is cholesterol there, regardless of what level it's at, making sure it doesn't become oxidized. Because as long as your cholesterol isn't oxidized, it's not bad cholesterol. Uh, maintaining healthy blood sugar is really important. Maintaining healthy blood pressure is critical. High blood pressure is an absolute undisputable risk factor associated with heart attacks and strokes. If you have been prescribed a blood pressure lowering medication, one or more, absolutely uh, take them as prescribed regularly, have your blood pressure monitored, it's critical. Also, keeping calcium in its place. As I mentioned, the calcium that can deposit in our blood vessels is a great predictor of your um, risk of a heart attack. And so we want to make sure that we have as little of that as possible where it shouldn't be. And then finally, supporting our endothelium. Um, a lot of these things weave together, but I will try my best to sort of tease them out. Okay, so... How do we take care of our endothelium? Here's a, a sort of a, a broad look at um, things that we can do. And then I will focus in on a few of the specifics. First of all, how can we hurt our endothelium? Let's start with the bad news. Uh, I've already you know, explained many of these. A lot of them are obvious, uh, but I'll, I'll you know, go into them just to be clear. Uh, being sedentary, specifically, not ever exercising, living a uh, sedentary lifestyle, the couch potato lifestyle, that will promote inflammation in the body. It's counterintuitive. How do you, th you think, how can you promote inflammation by doing nothing? But in fact, that's exactly what happens. Uh, and that will uh, be harmful to the endothelium. The endothelium has a hard time dealing with that kind of inflammation. Uh, so being sedentary, smoking, it's a no-brainer, but I have to mention it creates lots of free radicals. And it's not the nicotine, other than being addictive, there's really not a whole lot of problems with nicotine, but it's all the other toxins that we find in smoking. Vaping isn't any better. Stress, chronic stress uh, is harmful to the endothelium. Free radicals, so those are um, unpaired electrons. Those are created as part of our natural um, metabolism, absolutely. But they're also, more of them is, it, are generated by stress, by exposure to environmental toxins, for example. And over time, our antioxidant defenses can decrease. So we need to take more steps to make sure those free radicals aren't oxidizing our cholesterol and other tissues, because that's what they do. Free radicals are things that oxidize. Inflammation, I've already mentioned a few times. Uh, lack of quality sleep is something that will um, interfere with the function of our endothelium, is a, increases the risk for heart attacks and strokes. 
increase intake of omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, primarily, we get these in the diet from seed oils, you know, canola, sunflower, safflower oils. Um, these are the oils that were, you know, these are, these are made through industrial processes. They're relatively new in the diet. They were introduced really only in the last couple of generations as cheap alternatives to more traditional fats like butter. Uh, and they were, of course, for a long time touted as low fat or low saturated fat alternatives better than butter and were found to be um, absolutely not better. Um, and in fact, much worse, especially when they're cooked at high temperatures. Uh, like frying, for example. So avoiding those. Trans fats, we all we all know, uh, margarine, for example, the body just doesn't know how to process trans fats, very harmful. And a lack of key nutrients. I'm going to hone on this, which nutrients the endothelium needs to be helpful, or rather to be healthy. And if those nutrients are lacking, um, the endothelium will suffer. So I'll focus in on that. Okay, now the good news. How do we help our endothelium? Well, exercise, obviously, you know, I'm gonna say the opposite of everything I just said, but specifically exercise, relaxation and laughter. Specifically, I've got a study to show you about laughter a little bit later on. Uh, antioxidants, so these fight free radicals. And since free radicals will attack the endothelium, antioxidants will protect that. They will also protect, as I've said a few times, our cholesterol from becoming oxidized. Uh, minimizing sugar intake. High sugar and high insulin levels, hard on the cardiovascular system. And uh, so keeping those at a minimum is, is good. Uh, increased omega-3 essential fatty acids. Absolutely, omega-3s are associated with better endothelial function. They're anti-inflammatory. They're also associated with good brain health and skin health and you name it, they're good for everything. Um, specifically, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to be helpful for cardiovascular health, as everyone knows, and endothelial health in particular. And there's lots of good things, of course, to the Mediterranean diet. And I will focus in on, on one thing beyond the olive oil and red wine that may in fact be a key to the, the Mediterranean diet and certainly important for blood vessel health. Okay, so nutrients, we're going to focus in being a naturopathic doctor, I want to focus in on nutrients that heal the endothelium, where we can get them from our diet, when to consider a supplement. And these really do make a difference in terms of uh, heart health over the uh, short and long term because they feed and nourish and protect the endothelium and allow it to do its job. So there are a number of them, uh, but I'm going to focus in on some of either the lesser known or the ones that are so important, even if they are well known, uh, make sure everybody has the correct information about them. These include vitamin K2. Uh, magnesium, quercetin, uh, omega-3s, curcumin, um, and briefly about vitamin C. I've already touched on coenzyme Q10. Okay, so vitamin K2. This is the subject of my book, Vitamin K2 and the Calcium Paradox, How a Little Known Vitamin Could Save Your Life. And vitamin K2 is a nutrient that, among lots of other things, it primarily will direct calcium in the body. Specifically, it will make sure calcium is guided towards the bones and teeth, where you want it to be. And it keeps it out of soft tissues like arteries. Now, calcium can also build up in other areas around the body, heel spurs, kidney stones, crunchy little bits and joints and, you know, here and there. But uh, for our purpose tonight, we're looking at the buildup, inappropriate buildup of calcium in arteries, which we know it can be dangerous and even deadly. Um, so vitamin K2 specifically prevents and helps to reverse arterial calcifications and has been shown in clinical trials to reduce markers of arterial calcification uh, by acting on the endothelial cells, activating them and allowing them to clear out calcium. So when calcium starts to build up where it shouldn't, the body makes little proteins that could potentially go and scour and scavenge and remove the calcium, but it, those proteins need vitamin K2 to get, basically get switched on to do that. And uh, when vitamin K2 is lacking, calcium tends to build up. Conversely, for example, um, a recent, fairly recent clinical trial showing postmenopausal women with hardening of the arteries. So when we talk about hardening of the arteries, 
uh, it is literally calcium that is making the arteries hard and stiff. And this is something that can be measured. And in postmenopausal women with stiffening of the arteries due to this calcium deposition, vitamin K2 has been shown to re restore arterial flexibility and reverse arterial stiffness. Uh, and that's an important uh, factor in cardiovascular health and reducing heart attack risk. So where do we get vitamin K2 or where should we be getting it in through our diet? There's two main sources. One is grass-fed animal foods. Vitamin K2 is a fat-soluble vitamin, so you'll find a teensy bit of it in regular store-bought eggs or regular butter, a tiny, tiny amount. Uh, but if the animals who are producing those foods are out on pasture, so I mean literally eat it, like out on green grass, not just a cage-free open door policy, but in the fields, of course in the summertime, this doesn't work in the winter time uh, in most of Canada, uh, then those uh, uh, eggs and that butter, for example, will have a lot more vitamin K2 in it. So grass-fed animal foods. Now those are tricky to get year round, um, and especially in the winter time, very difficult to get. Fortunately, there's one other food source that is consistent year round for vitamin K2, and that is uh, certain types of fermented foods. So whether or not the milk was grass fed, for example, certain types of bacteria that make cheese uh, will produce vitamin K2. So brie, gouda, Jarlsberg, Gruyere, uh, these cheeses happen to be great sources of vitamin K2. That's why the cover of my book has a tower of cheese on it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some plant-based foods shortly. So, uh, if, you know, for my money, if you really want a heart-healthy snack, you cannot beat brie cheese and a glass of red wine. Okay, so... Um, Plant-based foods for vitamin K2. I talked about animal-based foods, uh, but it happens to be that the single highest known food in vitamin K2 is a plant-based food. So good news for people following plant-based diets. That is a food called natto, N-A-T-T-O. It's a Japanese fermented soybean food that is commonly eaten in some, but not all areas of Japan. And even if you were eating this just a couple times a week, it would give you enough vitamin K2 to improve heart health and bone health. Uh, so it's something you may be able to find at an Asian grocery store. You just thaw it and put it on rice. It is an acquired taste, and the texture is, can be challenging for some people, but I do encourage you to try it uh, because it is very healthy. Now, if you um, can't find natto, can't learn to love it, or um, you can only eat so much brie cheese, then supplement is a good option. So vitamin K2 is available on a, as a supplement either on its own or that you see right here, vitamin K2, or in combination with vitamin D. So this, it should say K2 and D3 because that's the types of the nutrients, but it just says K and D. Because um, vitamin K2 and, and vitamin D work together, they're partners. Vitamin D will help you absorb calcium. Vitamin K2 will then take that calcium and make sure it gets to the right places. If you're just taking vitamin D on its own, uh, you will continue to absorb calcium, but vitamin D has no control over where the calcium goes. It's rare to see problems with vitamin D, but um, people taking, I would say, more than four to 5,000 micrograms, uh, excuse me, international units of vitamin D per day, uh, over time, you potentially could see problems with calcification unless you balance it with vitamin K2. Um, so for if you already have vitamin D and are taking vitamin D, which you probably are, uh, you can get vitamin K2 on its own. If not, vitamin K and D come together. 100 micrograms or, or 120, basically one soft gel per day is a general, it's a good dose for general health maintenance. If you have bone health concerns, uh, clinical trials have used roughly double that, two capsules, the equivalent of two capsules per day. Um, for people with known arterial calcifications, uh, clinical trials have used uh, roughly three, would be three caps per day, uh, equivalent, three to four. Uh, as an example, if you were eating natto every day, as many Japanese people do, you'd be getting the equivalent of between three and four of these capsules on a daily basis. Uh, the, it has no drug interactions except for the blood thinner warfarin. 
Uh, if you were taking warfarin or warfarin type blood thinners, long story short, this can counteract that medicine and it's easier not to take them together. Uh, this does not apply to any other type of blood thinner like effient, Pradaxa, Xarelto, Aspirin, Plavix, anything else, just warfarin. Okay, so moving right along to magnesium. Now magnesium is a nutrient that does lots of things, uh, over 300 different actions in the body, specifically when it comes to cardiovascular health. It absolutely supports endothelial function, really important. It also is important for maintaining healthy blood pressure, it helps to lower blood pressure, really great effect on that. It's an anti-stress mineral, helps to combat stress, when we're under stress, we tend to deplete magnesium, which then throws off uh, everything else. Uh, it also works with vitamin K2 to keep calcium in its place. Magnesium helps to balance uh, and keep calcium in its place. We need magnesium to activate vitamin D. I, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, very commonly deficient. The recommended daily intake of magnesium for adults in Canada, and which is usually the bare minimum to be healthy, is around 400 milligrams. And you're, that's not just going to happen on its own. Um, soils have become depleted in magnesium, so it's not as rich in our foods as it used to be. And uh, this is where a uh, magnesium supplement oops, can be really handy. So where do we find magnesium in foods? I thought I had a slide in about that, but Green leafy vegetables are one of the best sources. Um, dark chocolate is an excellent source of magnesium. Nuts and seeds do contain magnesium, but they also contain a compound called phytate or phytic acid, which can block your absorption of magnesium. Uh, so they need to be soaked or sprouted to, to get that um, from nuts and seeds. Um, so a supplement can be very, very helpful. Uh, here's just another um, snapshot headline from the research papers showing that low magnesium um, interferes with healthy endothelial function. Okay, so there are lots of options in terms of magnesium on the market, as there should be. And, um, you know, two big options, two big categories are magnesium citrate, which I refer to as cheap and cheerful. It is inexpensive and generally quite consistently effective, uh, but for some reason or some, or some people, it can be hard on their stomach. If so, then magnesium bisglycinate is a form of magnesium. I've got a few uh, examples here. That is um, gentle on the stomach, still provides the benefits you want from magnesium. By the way, here's a kid's version, and I highlight this because uh, kids need magnesium as well and, and quite a bit of it. I'd like to zoom in on a, a type of magnesium here in a formula that I quite like for heart health, which is Dr. Gifford Jones Medi C Plus. This is a source of magnesium that also comes along with vitamin C and lysine. So vitamin C and lysine are nutrients that, among other things, are helpful for supporting collagen in the body. And because collagen forms the structure of so many things, including our blood vessels, and over time our collagen decreases with age, that can weaken blood vessels. And if the body decides there's an area of the blood vessel that's weak and wants to stick in some material to strengthen it up, that in certain instances can, uh, that area of damage being repaired can, can uh, start a plaque, for example. And so maintaining collagen is important, uh, and this is the Medi-C Plus is a way to get in your magnesium as well as nutrients that help support collagen formation. Uh, it's a powdered formula, by the way, it comes in a number of flavors, and because it's powdered, if you just want to have half a scoop or a full scoop or a little bit spread throughout the day, uh, magnesium, by the way, is very nice at bedtime because it helps to provide a nice sleep quality. Okay. Next is omega-3 essential fatty acids. These nutrients, as I mentioned, are so important for heart health, brain health, um, skin health, you name it. Um, and the main sources of omega-3s in our diet would come from, as well, back to those grass-fed animal foods, so hard to come by uh, in the wintertime especially, or deep cold water fish salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, herring, these kinds of things. 
Um, there are plant-based versions of omega-3s from flax oil, for example, but those short-chain omega-3s need to be connected to a long-chain form that the body actually uses, um, and the rate at which you make that conversion really varies uh, depending on the individual. So the preformed types that we would get from fish are uh, ideal, however, eating fish uh, especially those large fish, salmon that we love so much, really shouldn't be eating that more than twice a week. Even the wild caught ones will have environmental contaminants. Better to stick with smaller fish like anchovies and um, sardines. Um, but, uh, you know, in order to get those omega 3s in every day, uh, really, it's hard to be a good quality fish oil supplement. Fish oil supplements have been processed in a way that removes the contaminants that you find in fish. And so for that reason, and now this is where fish oil supplements, there's a big difference on the market in terms of quality, as well as quantity potency of, of the uh, omega-3s that you get in it. Um, and so to know that you are getting what you should be, check for a quality symbol. Here is one, the Isura symbol, that shows that the product is uh, meeting and exceeding contaminants testing set by Health Canada, about going above and beyond non-GMO, of course, and that you can be sure you're getting exactly what's saying on the, uh, it says on the label and that your fish oil is pure and potent. So here are a couple of examples of good quality fish oil. And I mentioned this because recently my mom showed me something she was taking that she got at a discount store and I was just <laughs> couldn't believe she had bought this and was taking it. And it had, I don't know what was in it, but there certainly wasn't any active ingredient in this fish oil. Um, so some of the things to look for. I have here uh, some options in terms of a pill and a liquid. So uh, some people like to take, um, just easier to take, a, um, say, a soft gel capsule that has a liquid fish oil inside, or you want to take the liquid straight. It's, it's an either or situation. Um, so here are two good examples. Liquid is nice, I think, because uh, it tastes good. And if something tastes good, you remember to take it, especially if you have kids, the whole family can take it. So the Sealicious here on the right is an example of a fish oil that's Pure, potent, tasty, easy to remember to take then. Um, and it will get you a therapeutic amount of the essential fatty acids, the omega-3s, EPA and DHA, as we call them, um, in every spoonful. On the flip side, some people just don't like the texture of an oil. Okay, that's fine. The RX omega-3 here on the left, this particular one happens to be 900 milligrams um, typically, you'd want around 900 to 1,000, it's very close, uh, milligrams of essential fatty acids per day. And to be honest, in the winter time, I usually recommend doubling that. So uh, a two per day um, to get around roughly 2,000 milligrams of the omega-3s in the winter time. Um, oh, and by the way, taking a quality omega-3 supplement has been shown to reduce the risk of death from cardiovascular disease by 62%, 47% reduction in the risk of de developing dementia. This helps, as I mentioned, with inflammation. It helps prevent um, platelets from sticking, which is something that can generate blood clots. Um, it does a lot. It helps to lower triglycerides, which is an important um, lipid in the body and uh, it, it does a lot in terms of cardiovascular health. Okay, moving along to our, I think this is our second to last nutrient uh, in terms of supporting endothelial health. And this is one that you might not be familiar with or you may have heard a little bit more about it in um, recent months, and that is quercetin. So quercetin is a bio, uh, it's a flavonoid, which is a, a vitamin-like molecule, um, as we call it, that it is available or found in a number of types of plant foods. Uh, capers happen to be one of the highest known foods in quercetin. Um, green leafy vegetables like herbs, sorrel, dock, parsley, onions, and apples are another um, high one for quercetin. And this was discovered by the same person who discovered and won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of vitamin C. These two uh, seem to be found together in many foods and work together. And quercetin, in fact, may be 
one of the important key benefits to the Mediterranean diet. Uh, in addition to the olive oil and red wine, in fact, the high quercetin content has shown to be very beneficial for blood vessels. It is deemed by Health Canada to be a blood vessel protectant. It helps to uh, act on the endothelium to help reduce blood pressure, acts as an antioxidant, helps prevent um, platelets from sticking, so that's something that can help um, minimize blood clots, has anti-inflammatory uh, actions on that level. So uh, doesn't, you know, it, quercetin does a lot for the blood vessels. So I encourage people to get all kinds of green leafies, herbs, capers, if you, you know, can find them or enjoy them into your diet. But if you're concerned about blood vessel health, then consider a quercetin supplement. And this is one of those nutrients that benefits. You can, you can absorb it on its own, uh, but it benefits from a little bit of enhancement in terms of it bumping up the absorption. So quercetin lipomycel matrix is an example of an enhanced absorption form of quercetin, uh, combining quercetin with ingredients that causes it to form in the stomach and in the digestive tract micelles. These are tiny little droplets containing quercetin on the inside, which are then uh, readily absorbed into the body. And, uh, and a great antioxidant and a blood vessel protectant. Okay. And so then the last nutrient that I want to mention, one that is famous, I'm sure you've heard of it, and yet there is a lot of uh, myth and misinformation around it, that's curcumin. So curcumin comes from the herb turmeric. Here's turmeric here. It's a member of the ginger family. As you can see, it looks quite a bit like ginger, but it's more orange on the inside. Uh, you can find it in fresh forms. You can find it in powdered forms. Uh, and turmeric contains a number of uh, constituents, but the medicinal or therapeutic component of turmeric is called curcumin. And curcumin is a fantastic antioxidant and a fantastic anti-inflammatory. Most people know it as a natural anti-inflammatory and will take it for you know, pain, aches and pains, joint health, for example, these kinds of things. Um, but it also plays a really important role in heart health because it's an anti-inflammatory, yes, because it will prevent your um, LDL cholesterol from becoming oxidized, so keeping all the cholesterol you have working for you, um, and, and lots of other things. But curcumin only works if you absorb it, like anything else. But the difference with curcumin is it's quite difficult to absorb on its own. In its natural state, a standard curcumin powder, for example, studies have been done, uh, not just turmeric, but actual curcumin powder, grams and grams of it, like spoonfuls of it, and blood levels uh, pretty much don't change. So you really do need to take an enhanced absorption form when it comes to curcumin. So here's an example of um, an enhanced absorption form. This is curcumin. Takes curcumin, grinds it down to a teeny tiny particle, which then makes it very easy to absorb. Uh, and so because of that, more and more clinical trials are using this specific form of curcumin because the results that you get are consistent, because blood levels are consistent. Uh, so there are more double-blind uh, published clinical trials of this form of curcumin than any other on the market. And it is one that will give you know, consistent results uh, so you can get what you want and get what you're paying for from curcumin products. So this is where you know, it can be very difficult to judge apples to apples when shopping for curcumin, which is why I recommend that you shop uh, at a place like Nature's Fair where people can um, give you, uh, you know, answer your questions, explain the difference between the various products on the market. Okay, and then, so that's all the nutrients I want to focus on. And I did promise a study about laughter, specifically one done at the University of Maryland Medical Center, showing that laughter causes the endothelium, so the lining, that, the, the lining of the blood vessels, to dilate and expand in order to increase blood flow. So laughter has been shown to be found very beneficial for heart health because it's good for your endothelium, allows it to relax, 
dilate, expand, and increase blood flow. And um, that's good news. And it's a note that I want to leave on as we get up just uh, to time uh, to answer questions that I'm sure you have been typing in. Perfect. Thank you. That was amazing. Thanks. <laughs> we do have quite a bit of questions here, so I'm just going to jump right into it. We'll do a little bit of a, a rapid fire question answer session. <laughs> Let me start off. Um, this is right from the beginning. What is better for your health? COQ10, berberine, or olive leaf? Ooh, wow. Uh, what a great question. I mean, as an overall general, t I, I would really be torn between CoQ10 and berberine. Berberine, you know, it's, it's one, I didn't want to overwhelm people with too many um, options, but certainly it is an important nutrient with, for overall metabolic health as well as heart health. Um, it's one that helps to flip the master switch for metabolism. It'd be a real tough call between berberine and CoQ10. Um, so I'm going to have to call that a draw. <laughs> I love it. I <laughs> All right. Next up, if you get high cholesterol from a medication, will it go down when you stop taking it? Uh, yes, typically. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to work with your doctor on that, but uh, Yes. And could you please talk about the value of having a heart CT scan? Right. So the heart CT scan, um, that's what I was mentioning, is called the CAC coronary artery calcium scan. It is not, uh, like I said, it's, it's not offered that I know uh, almost anywhere in Canada. You need a specialized type of super fast CT scan that can image a beating heart without looking blurry, essentially. Um, but this is one that will can measure and then quantify the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries that feed the heart. And that number um, is quite a good predictor of your risk of heart attack. Gotcha. Here's one. Is Hawthorne good for your cholesterol or heart? Oh, okay. So Hawthorne is a nutrient that is does not affect cholesterol. Uh, significantly to my knowledge, but it is one that has been shown to be uh, beneficial for heart function uh, per se, but I, I would tend to use that in, in specific instances and as not usually as a general recommendation. Gotcha. All right. This is a sort of a collection. A lot of people have had the same question. How does one know if they have high inflammation? So how can you tell just naturally and if there is a blood test to test that? Yes, excellent question. Uh, you can, you, you may not be able to tell. Obviously, if you're in pain anywhere, joint pain, any kind of pain, that is a sign of inflammation. But, you know, I've been, I've been talking about inflammation a lot tonight, and specifically as it pertains to the cardiovascular system, uh, it's often what we call silent inflammation. In other words, it's not painful. It doesn't announce itself in any way. And so how do you know? There is a test you can get at your uh, doctor's office as part of your general uh, annual checkup, the CRP test. And the, the CRP test is a measure of inflammation. Now, it won't, if, the, if that number is high, it won't necessarily tell you what's causing that inflammation, but it is a marker and a measure of whether there is inflammation happening in the body. Excellent. All right, next up, uh, this lovely lady had a stent put in her her heart in 2012, and she's wondering if she should get it checked or if it needs to be replaced any time in the future. Oh, it's, it's definitely a good idea to get it checked to make sure that it's staying patent, as we call it, which means it's staying clear and open. Uh, that's definitely something. It doesn't necessarily have to be removed or replaced, but it's something that it should be uh, monitored. All right. And are stents harmful to the endothelium? Uh, no, I mean, they're, they're doing their job in the area that when, which they were placed uh, to keep that blood vessel open. And uh, you can still, you know, everything else, as long as you're not on uh, warfarin blood thinners, which 
usually not long term, but often short term after that to kind of an operation. But everything else I mentioned can still be helpful for maintaining uh, endothelial health throughout the body. All righty. Uh, this lady is asking about menopause and if it's a factor in all the supplements that we take or anything to do with heart risks. Yes. So estrogen is a protector against heart disease, uh, which is why before menopause, women tend to have very low rates of heart disease, low rates of heart attack. But after menopause, men and women tend to catch up in terms of their risk and rates of heart disease and heart attacks. Um, and so, yes, that is a factor. And when estrogen levels decline, which is normal, they're, they're supposed to, uh, and we can have that happen and still maintain our heart health, but we may need to be a little bit more proactive, uh, including the kinds of things I was saying here tonight, become even more important for women after menopause. Wow. Interesting. All right. What would be the best all around antioxidant to take and how much daily? Mm -hmm. I would say best all around antioxidant that also has lots of other side benefits would be the theracurmin here, the curcumin rich on, on the very far left. And typically it, for, you know, general health maintenance, you can take one capsule a day, even one of the regular strength um, a day. Uh, but for, you know, if you're 50 plus, if you think you have any kinds of signs and symptoms, inflammation, concern about heart health, uh, I would say two caps per day. If you have painful situation, then you want to be taking the double strength two to three caps per day. Alrighty. What is considered a high level of LDL? Oh my goodness. I, I pay so little attention. So I think now we're looking at anything over five and or five and a half, I believe is now the cutoff for recommending um, statins, for example. And all right, um, on to K2s. So do K2s help with kidney stones? Potentially, yep. So uh, kidney stones can be a, a buildup of calcium and vitamin K2 can help prevent, not necessarily reverse, depending on what's going on or, or how the formation has happened, but certainly prevention. Okay. And do you have any K, is there any K2 in dark green leafy vegetables? No K2. There's vitamin K1 in green leafy vegetables, uh, but the body doesn't necessarily convert that to vitamin K2. And so the food sources I mentioned, natto, cheeses, grass-fed foods, um, those are uh, sources of K2. Gotcha. And then can you take vitamin D in the morning and K2 in the evening? Sure, if you wanted to, yeah, you could do that. They don't necessarily be, have to same, be in the same mouthful. You can take them separately if you wanted to. And any recommendations on vegetarian omega-3s? So uh, obviously, you know, focusing on the flax oils, um, hemp oils, uh, those are, are sources of omega-3s. Mm -hmm. As well, there are certain, you can get... Uh, uh, vegetarian based and plant based DHA. So, for example, uh, in the whole earth and sea line, it comes in a little green box um, with leaves and flowers on it. There's a marine DHA. It's tough to get EPA in, from plant based sources, but the DHA you can certainly get from uh, plant based sources. Okay, I have actually quite a few questions about the same topic in terms of there's a lot of supplements that we should be taking. Um, any recommendations? Should one just take everything that you have listed? Is there a, a better time like in the morning or afternoon or evening to take certain ones? Um, mostly with food uh, and generally it doesn't matter time of day. Magnesium is quite nice to take at bedtime. I, I just find it helps to relax muscles. It helps to prevent muscle cramps at night, Charlie horse, things like that. Uh, provides a nice sleep quality. So that's just a preference of taking magnesium at bedtime, but pretty much everything else can be taken at any time or with meals. Gotcha. Oh, here's a good question. Um, this lovely lady wants to know if she can book an appointment with you. Mm. 
Well, I am based in, I guess right now it doesn't matter because we're doing everything online, but <laughs> I'm based in Ontario. And unfortunately, I'm not currently actively seeing patients, uh, but I'm sure that you have a referral uh, likely at the store maybe of practitioners that you work with or naturopathic doctors that you work with, Melissa? Absolutely. I'll right. put a link to, uh, we have four nutritionists and naturopathic doctors that I'll put a link that you can book a complimentary session with them, a 30 minute one, and then you can go from there. I'll put that link in the chat box right after this. Um, should people take a calcium supplement? This actually, this lovely lady, before we go further, she has CAD. Oh, okay. So if you have been diagnosed Sorry, the, the person uh, with coronary artery disease wants to know if she should take a calcium supplement. Is that what we're... Yeah, well, her mm. and her son. One has CAD and one doesn't. Oh, okay. So if you have been... I don't generally recommend a calcium supplement uh, to all people all the time. Definitely not. Or all women all the time. There was a concept at one point, just because you're a woman, you need to take calcium Absolutely not. If you have been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, then a certain amount of calcium from supplements can be helpful. If not, then you don't need a calcium supplement uh, in general. And specifically, if you know that you have um, calcium blockages anywhere, uh, then I would use calcium with caution or, or not at all. All righty. Next up, we're going back to K2. Does K2 thicken the blood? No, it has no uh, blood thickening effects. But the only um, exception is for people on warfarin whose blood is artificially thin due to that specific medication. It can counteract that, but otherwise um, does not promote blood clotting. All righty. And should we avoid certain foods to lower cholesterol? Yes, there are certain foods you should avoid to lower cholesterol, but probably not the ones that you think. Um, so absolutely fried foods, yes, because you want to avoid those omega-6 essential fatty acids, especially when they're cooked at high temperatures, really not good. Uh, but probably the single biggest food to avoid um, when you're trying to lower cholesterol is sugar. White sugar, white flour, those things will promote inflammation, insulin levels, and get your cholesterol level up. Um, that's what to avoid. All right. Questions are just flying in. I'm going to narrow it down. We've got just two more because, uh, Dr. Kate, your, your time is valuable and I know it's quite late for you right now. <laughs> All right. Next up is what does a calcium channel blocker do? Oh, so this is a medicine that uh, can be used to um, affect blood pressure. And so it's, it's a type of uh, blood pressure medicine. All righty. Um, you know what? I think this is great. I think we'll end it there. There were some amazing questions and you've covered a lot of information and, and we're so very thankful that you've taken the time to, to share your knowledge with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a really important topic, one I love discussing, and I, I really appreciate the engagement. So many people with great questions. Thanks, everyone. Right, absolutely. And I will be taking a copy of this and putting it on to the Nature's Fair YouTube channel tomorrow so you can go back and uh, look at the questions and look at the slides at any point. All right, everybody, thank you so much and have yourself a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Good night.